welcome back to the Jet Press Podcast. My name is Justin Freed, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Mike Luciano. Mike, how you doing today, buddy? What's going on? Uh, not my best, uh, mostly just because I thought that there was this lesion on my football team that was finally going to be, what do they call it? What do they call it, a biopsy when they cut something off you and look at it? and sure. throw it? That's what it is, sure. a biopsy? It probably, yeah, probably, sure. I, I thought that was finally going to happen. As we finally get rid of this guy who would be named, we tried not to say his name very much in the offseason because we thought finally we're done with him. We may not be done with him, but no matter what happens with that player who we'll get into, we'll also talk a lot of draft stuff because free agency isn't over necessarily, but a lot of the big names are already signed. So it seems like the movement's kind of slowed down. So we'll look at the draft. We'll look at maybe some mid-round quarterbacks to target because that seems to be a thing a lot of people have the Jets doing is taking a mid-round quarterback. And we'll get into what's left for free agency because there's still some needs on this Jets team. No team is perfect. And maybe they'll fill them in free agency. Maybe they'll fill them in the draft. Who knows? But we'll tell you what they got to do. So before all that, though, you can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We're on all the sites, YouTube, at the Jet Press. If you want to support the show, like liking the stream really does help. And leaving a good review on Apple Podcasts, that really helps just for the algorithm to boost us up, not to stroke our massive ego. That is just purely to help us in the algorithm. So if that's how you want to show your support, that's how you do it. And we are very grateful for however you do choose to show that support. So now that we got the housekeeping out of the way, we can get into talking ball with a name that we we thought this would be the end of them. And wishful thinking because Zach Wilson might not be gone yet. Because I thought Zach Wilson would be gone, not even necessarily after I didn't let the defense down in New England in that loss. Like That seemed like that was the de facto end of Zach Wilson. But when he played on Thursday night against the Jaguars and that pouring rain and then Chris Trevor came in, I'm like, that feels like the end. That, that feels good. like he's dead and buried. And it is currently March 27th, 2024, and he's still on the team, and he might be back next year. No. Because – no, Woody Johnson. Not. Don't even put that out there, Mike. He will not. Well, <laughs> that's just what Woody Johnson is saying because the Jets have been trying and failing to trade Zach Wilson this offseason. Uh, in an offseason that's had a lot of backup quarterback movement where obviously the Jets signing Tyrod Taylor to take over from Wilson as the backup. Uh, just And a lot of young trades, too. A lot of guys getting traded. Justin Fields going to the Steelers for a steal of a deal, if you'll excuse the pun, because – there was just they had to go pay him later, but Fields is a lot better than what he was worth. Desmond Ritter going to the Cardinals, Sam Howell going to the Seahawks. All of that took away landing spots for Wilson. Sam Darnold even going to Minnesota. There's a lot of backup quarterbacks on the move. So the landing spots are not particularly fruitful. And I think this is just a case of Joe Douglas maybe screwing himself a bit. I know he's got this reputation as, you know, Trader Joe and he makes all these great deals and I mean, it's warranted. I mean, look at the Jamal Adams thing. Look at the Morgan Moses deal. Like, he's good at that. But he had a price in his head of what Zach Wilson is worth and what he thought a number two pick would be worth. Because, again, look at what Desmond Ritter did, what what he got, and look at what Sam Howell got. Key point of difference, both those two guys, as bad as they were last year, were better than Zach Wilson. And there's at least they showed something there. However minuscule it may have been, you could at least look at Sam Howell and be like, I could see how in an ideal situation he's got the arm talent to succeed. Or you look at Desmond Ritter where you're like, you know, if he comes in for like five, six games as a backup, he's a very good athlete. Like he can get the job done as a backup. But you could see something there. With Wilson, yeah, he's got an arm. Everybody's got an arm. It's the NFL. So because of that, nobody's really biting on it. And now Douglas is kind of painting himself into a corner because I don't think he wants to just eat his money. And no team is going to trade for him as a backup, if that makes any sense, because no team's going to trade for Zach Wilson thinking he's going to be our number two quarterback. The only way they're going to even potentially offload him is maybe some team will take him on as QB3 and then try to hope against hope that he finally figures it out. He's not going to, but they're at least going to hope that. Jugla- Douglas, if he really thought, I'm going to say Douglas, because I Douglas, did, nice. couldn't decide on the first name. If Doe Douglas <laughs> decided – that he's like, all right, you know what, Zach Wilson, he's going to have a very rich market. Teams are going to be clamoring over the arm talent. 
Now you have egg on your face. Right. Nobody wants him. You want to yourself. It's musical chairs, and he's the only one who didn't get a chair. I know it's – I'll go on record saying this. It is March 27, 2024. I, I would be absolutely stunned and floored, and I think there is a 0% chance that it happens, that Zach Wilson is on the Jets roster come week one of 2024. I will go on record saying that. I don't care what Woody Johnson just said this week. Uh, Zach Wilson is not going to be on the Jets roster in 2024. Will he be on the Jets after the draft? Yeah, it's certainly very possible. I, I'm not confident that they trade him before the draft, but I would be stunned, like floored. It'd be one of the most stunning things the Jets have done in years, and that is saying a lot if Zach Wilson was on the Jets roster week one, 2024. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to get traded before the draft. Uh, and I also don't know if this is a situation where I'm going to blame Joe Douglas. Obviously, you could blame Joe, Joe Douglas. You could blame Joe Douglas for making the draft pick in the first place. saying that. We, we yeah. got to train ourselves out of that. I don't know what kind of beast it I'm sounds, on It kind of sounds right, though. I don't know. Um, but I don't think there's a situation. Evil twin with a handlebar mustache. <laughs> or maybe he has no no beard, but he has like a full head of hair. <laughs> He's got like a like a '90s flat top. Yeah. Oh my. Oh my God. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Sure, that's no Douglas. Um, but no, I don't think you could blame Joe or Doe. Uh, <laughs> so dumb for not being able to trade Zach Wilson at this point because he has no trade value. He he, he has absolutely no trade value at this point. Uh, not well, only I guess like, the thought then is you don't think some teams thought, hey, we'll flip you a conditional seventh or something like that, and Joe said. So, no, I want something more from him. I feel like that conversation's happened. There's been conflicting information out there about what is going on with the Joe or the Zach Wilson trade talks. Uh, there was a report from Pro Football Talk, Mike, Mike Florio. Uh, I think it was last week, this weekend, whenever it was, that his report said that the Jets have received offers for Zach Wilson, but they are holding out, waiting for something better. He, this wasn't a report, but he speculated. He said that some people around the league believe that Woody Johnson is the one that's intervening. Other reports, including, I believe, a report that went up from Zach Rosenblatt of The Athletic today, said that that's not true. The Jets have not received any offers for Zach Wilson and that there's no indication at all that, you know, Woody Johnson has any say in any of this. I wouldn't be stunned if the Woody thing is partially true in the sense that I think Woody would be pressuring the Jets and pressuring Joe Douglas to try and get something for him. I don't think Woody Johnson would like the optics of the Jets simply outright releasing Zach Wilson. But I don't think, and this is my opinion on what's going on based on the reports that I've seen, I don't think the Jets have received a formal offer for Zach Wilson. I, I, I think there's been discussions. I think there's been preliminary talks about, hey, you know, let's check in on what your asking price might be. I don't think the Jets have received anything, any kind of offer for Zach Wilson, because logically, this is a situation where the Jets do not want to be paying his full salary. That is over $11 million on the cap next year. If they release him, they do not want to be doing that. If they trade him, it's... They save around six million, five million, whatever it is, because it's five and a half million guaranteed money that goes to the team that's trading for him, unless the Jets eat some of that money, which I think that's the most likely scenario. I think the Jets either eat some of his contract, uh, more than they would have to eat already, or they include a draft pick to trade him. I think that's what it's going to come down to because I don't think you're getting anything for him. The other thing that I can very well see happening is I, I at this point, I think the most likely scenario is the Jets wait till after the draft to trade him. And that sucks. I, I think you'd want to get rid of him, like you said, this lesion. I'm not going to use that word. I feel like that's mean, but you want to get rid of this. What else is mean is subjecting my eyes to that for three years. That's not considerate okay. either, Zach. You're right. And I'll, I'll blame, you know, I, I guess you could blame Zach for that, but I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to use, I don't want to use that word, but I, I don't think it's fair for either side to hold on to him longer than you should. But ultimately it might just make the most sense to wait until after the draft, because at this point we're almost in April now. I don't think there's many teams that are super active looking for quarterbacks. Like you said, a lot of those spots have been filled. Uh, Kenny Pickett, Mac Jones, Justin Fields, Desmond Ritter. There's, there's so many guys who've been traded. Justin Fields, I think I said him twice now. But so many so many different uh, young quarterbacks have been traded to other teams. And like you said, Mike, Zach Wilson is not going to be a QB2 next year. He, he's just not going to be. Just like it would be stunned and absolutely floored if Zach Wilson was on the Jets roster in uh, come week one, I'd also be the same level of stunned if he was any team's QB2. The most likely scenario for Zach Wilson is either he's released or he's traded to a team and he fights for a third quarterback spot. And maybe he makes the team. Maybe he sticks around in the practice squad. That, that's what we're talking about with Zach Wilson. There's no, no teams giving him a shot as QB2. The only team I think that I could possibly imagine doing that is the Chiefs because they still don't really have a backup quarterback. Uh, I think they might end up bringing back Blaine Gabbert eventually. But as of right now, they don't have one. There's the BYU connection with Andy Reid, which we've talked about. It's the only spot that still makes some sort of sense for Zach to compete for a backup quarterback job. But 
I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think the Chiefs are going to go into next year with Zach Wilson as Patrick Mahomes' primary backup. I think that would be a a gross mismanagement on the part of uh, – Golf in, in talent between those right. two. It, it would be terrible. So as we sit here right now, March 27th, I think my prediction as for what will happen to Zach Wilson is – the Jets will trade him after the draft because the other advantage of, of trading him after the draft is you now get access to future picks. 2025 becomes your, you know, your, your most recent draft, right? And that's still a year in the future. You can now also trade 2026 draft picks. And I think we could see a situation where maybe the max the Jets get is like a 2026 conditional seventh round pick. And if they get that, that's a win because you don't have to give up draft capital to do that, right? Or maybe the Jets trade a 2026 seventh round pick to get rid of Wilson and his salary. Either way, you're opening up more opportunities. You're opening up, you know, you, there, there's more you can do if you wait until after the draft and the the kind of the the, the dust settles and teams are, are aware of what their quarterback situation is. That's, I think, the most likely scenario. But I don't believe Woody Johnson for one second when he says that if we don't trade him, we're keeping him. I don't believe that at all, especially given that Woody Johnson six weeks ago said, hey, we didn't even have a backup quarterback last year. And then six weeks later, he's like, oh, yeah, but Zach Wilson, he's a valuable asset. We're not going to just give him away. Somebody – take away any microphone, any live mic from Woody Johnson, because for somebody who has spent his entire life speaking in front of, of, of cameras and a microphone, he still doesn't know how to not put his foot in his mouth. So, but I, I don't believe Woody Johnson. I don't believe Woody Johnson when he says they're not going to keep him or that they're going to keep him. Zach Wilson will not be on the Jets roster in 2024. Woody's okay. At like getting at like hyping fans up. Like we got this good acquisition. Like we're going for it. Like he's good at that. He's a terrible liar. It's not hard to do that. And I, I like I, Robert Sala too, but from Sala to Douglas to Johnson, this organization is horrible at lying. I think Douglas usually does a pretty good job of it. Sala wears his heart on his sleeve. We know that. I think Douglas does a pretty good job. That I, I do like your idea though of how – do you remember when Brock Osweiler got traded to the Browns? And they, it was like a second-round pick. It was like a second-round pick the Texans gave up. Just he'd get him away. Like yes. that might have to happen. I don't I'm think also be just glad because finally I won't have to look at at the Zach Wilson truthers. I'm just sick of them. Like I obviously like everybody can consume information differently on Twitter because it's you know curated to you. But I mean, there are times where you look at Trevor Lawrence who got picked before him ten times better minimum than Zach Wilson. And I see more like Trevor Lawrence sucks than Zach Wilson sucks sometimes. The Trevor Lawrence narrative is crazy right now. It's a, I actually doesn't it's not healthy. You know, you know what? I, it's because people – I've seen people do this where, like, oh, Mac Jones is better because the cumulative stats, because like, they leave in the rookie and year. Trevor Lawrence. Meyer. I've, I've, I've seen it, believe oh, me. There's still so many Jets fans who think Zach Wilson is better than Mac Jones. Which, exactly. Like, but I've never seen – I've seen players that are bad. Yeah. And they get hate. I've even seen players that are bad. And you know, you know what? Maybe it's not another fault. Like, the Jets didn't fail Zach Wilson necessarily. They failed Darnold. Like, Darnold's a legitimate case of they didn't just give him a good environment and he struggled. He's not good, but that's a legitimate argument for they failed him. But Zach Wilson is, like, so bad, it's, like, come back around. And now where people are like, well, he's got to be good somewhere because he can't be this bad. Like, okay. maybe he just sucks that much. And it's permeated Instagram and, and Twitter. Like, it's it's frightening. It doesn't make any sense. It's weird. It's not even Jets fans or BYU fans who are doing this now. Like, I used to think that's just what it was. is because Jets fans are so desperate for a quarterback. They want him to be good. Sorry, that was number one. Then that's out of there. Or maybe it's just BYU fans. Okay. It's not just BYU fans because it's other teams who are like, oh, maybe Zach. Wrong. I, I don't get it. I don't. There's nothing he's shown you. He's played well, how many good games he had in his career? Three? At like 30 something, 20 yeah, something Texans, Chiefs, and then what the the rookie season against the Titans, maybe I don't know. <laughs> that was James on Twitter. T Law had a Bryce Hall regression. No, no he didn't. Hold on. This here's the thing though Bryce Hall is still not bad. Like this, I, I hate I'm gonna defend both Bryce Hall and Trevor Lawrence here. Bryce Hall was good last year. Bryce Hall could earn, like compete for a starting job. Like he's not a bad cornerback by any means. And on Trevor Lawrence, name me 12 quarterbacks that are better than Trevor Lawrence. You can't. There aren't. There are not 12 quarterbacks in the NFL that are not that are better than Trevor Lawrence. Well, right he's now. not generational. That's your problem if you keep calling him that. He's still good. If you draft any quarterback at any point in the draft and they end up like Trevor Lawrence, you won. You succeeded. Is he is he a Hall of Famer right now? No. 
I, he could, he could eventually get on that trajectory. He's still very young. He's entering what his fourth year in the NFL, yeah. and he's a top twelve quarterback. With Sign Trent Bulky and Urban Meyer, as who brought him into the league. It's like, yeah, right. It's Jets fans fun. like to complain about Joe Douglas. Other right. teams have Trent Bulky. Like, think yeah. about that. So, sign me up for Trevor Lawrence. If the Jets were to ever draft a Trevor Lawrence type of prospect, every single Jets fan would be. Oh, he would be the king of the city. Right. He's would he good. not be? Yeah, he would be like, and that's, that's the thing. It's, it's expectations. That's what it comes down to. Trevor Lawrence, if you want to consider the, the insane expectations he had entering the NFL, sure. He hasn't lived up to them. He's not a top five quarterback in the NFL right now. He's not Patrick Mahomes. He's not Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, whatever. He's not any of those guys, but he's still really good. Like he's still a very good quarterback. Better, better than Zach Wilson. You know what he you want? Know if yeah. they traded him, they'd get more than a conditional seventh round pick for him. They, they would get many first round picks. Many first round picks. <laughs> what T Lord you guys watch? The guy who was playing really well. That's who. <laughs> the same Trevor Lawrence that everybody should have watched. Yeah, so it's, moving it's, on though, because the Jets might need to go. They're not going to necessarily draft a Trevor Lawrence this year. They're not even going to draft a quarterback in the first three rounds. I think that's kind of gone out the window now oh, that Tyrod yeah. Taylor's here. But taking a mid round prospect just to sit him on the practice squad and have him marinate for a little bit, and then maybe he's the long term backup eventually because Taylor's going to leave Aaron Rodgers is going to leave like and I I kind of don't necessarily hate the the Ron Wolf or even the Patriots thinking of like just keep drafting quarterbacks every year no matter how many you have just because you never know I mean look at all the guys that the Patriots see Kevin O'Connell Ryan Mallett rest in peace Ryan Mallett like all the guys that they just kept funneling in as QB3s because you never know when you're going to need another quarterback looking at this class it's a weird class because it's so top heavy i can't remember one i think maybe 2015 or 16 what was it 15 when winston and mariota went one two yeah that was 15 and then i don't think anybody else went until like the third round that was garrett grayson who never played like garrett outside grayson. of that that's a throwback name out of colorado state but yep. i really there's the top guys you know caleb williams drake may Jaden daniels there's the fringe guys, you know, J.J. McCarthy, Bo ne Apparently, J.J. McCarthy's going number two now for reasons that don't make any sense at all, but that's where he is talent-wise. And then there's really, like, a huge gap. And then there's, like, Spencer Rattler and then a bunch of day three guys. It's a really weird class. So I, I went and looked at some of those day three guys. And I'm trying to figure out, because Rattler, it seems like, it's going to be a late day two guy. He's probably, like, a third-round guy. So I'm looking at the day three guys. I'm like, all right, there's got to be – a couple hidden gems here, a couple guys that if the Jets get them in their system, and I hate to use this word because this is what killed us with Zach, but learn behind Aaron Rodgers and learn behind the, the, the offensive guru that is Nathaniel Hackett, as silly as that sounds because it's not true. Hey, don't, Maybe don't eventually they could turn forget, into something. Don't forget Todd Downing. Don't forget Todd Downing. Man. Oh, of course. Well, how could I possibly forget the immortal, the, my benigno voice, the immortal Todd Downing. <laughs> <laughs> but... I'm looking at these guys, and one guy kept coming up, and he seems to be the consensus QB8 favorite here, kind of a fourth-round lock. Consensus and that QB8. is uh, Michael Pratt from yeah. Tulane, the Green Wave. Pratt is kind of a unique prospect because you really don't see a ton of guys, honestly, if you're a good quarterback, stick around for all four years. And, uh, and he did at Tulane, won a bunch of games, beat USC in the Cotton Bowl, which that defense being what it is, I don't care. If you beat USC as Tulane, that's pretty impressive in any field. He beat Caleb Williams because Caleb played in that game. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at him, and he doesn't have, like, the greatest arm. It's a pretty average arm. He's got, like, a weird – not a Blake Bortles he wind up. I mean, that's obviously the, the most extreme ever is Blake Bortles, but it's kind of long and loopy, almost like Justin Fields where he, like, brings it down around his hip. And then out, almost like a baseball throw. It's like he's throwing from shortstop to get a guy at first base. And deep deep ball-wise, he's not kind of what you want. Like, there's a lot of misses, a lot of inconsistencies in ball placement. But I'm looking at Tulane, which is a, it's not like a super wide open offense, but they let him chuck it around a bit. And he's really good on the move, really good at throwing from all kinds of different angles. Very Darnold-esque in that he probably gets better on the move than he does in the pocket. Like good Darnold out of USC, if that makes any sense. 
I like his mechanics. I like that he's a four-year guy, knows knows like a pro-style offense, very good at manipulating guys pre-snap. Like He seems like a guy who's going to have a long career because he could pick up an offense pretty quickly. Now the arm the arm is average, and if he because guys can improve your arm strength a little bit in the league. If he could show a willingness to make those throws, those challenging throws where guys aren't wide open, and then accuracy on them, he'd be a perfect fourth round pick. And he could be you know a guy who gets called into action every now and again, has a very long career as like a ten year backup, maybe a spot starter like a Minshewy kind of guy. Because all the other guys around him have some severe flaws that take them into like the fifth, sixth, seventh round range. Pratt doesn't really have that. Like, if you want to create the most average quarterback prospect where he's pretty good at almost everything, Michael Pratt's a pretty good guy. And to get him in the fourth round, I don't think that'd be a horrible pick for the Jets. No, I think you said it best when I, you said that Michael Pratt's going to have a long NFL career. I completely agree. I, I think he is a really, really good backup quarterback prospect. That's That's how I would classify him. I don't think he has the traits or physical talent or size or anything like that to ever be – a top 10 quarterback. I think at best you're hoping that his ceiling is maybe he can eventually develop into like a middling starter, maybe in, in like his, his ceiling. Um, and that's fine. Like you're, you're looking at fourth, fifth round quarterback prospects here. You're not going to, you know, in most cases, you're not finding a diamond in the rough gem quarterback. Even like a Brock Purdy is just an extreme anomaly when you can get a quarterback like that uh, anywhere past really the first round or even maybe the second round. Um, if you're once you're reaching that third, fourth round territory, it's it's a very low hit rate when it comes to quarterbacks. But Michael Pratt is someone I think will have a long career as a backup. He just fits that backup mold as a, a smart quarterback, like you said, can pick up a system well. Doesn't have the physical traits, but he just he, he really fits that backup mold. And I think that's fine if the Jets are looking for somebody like that. Who you know he reminds maybe, me of upon a little bit closer thinking, no. if Jimmy G had a little bit better mobility. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I feel like I that's a good comparison. I feel I feel like a lot of Gar- like a Garoppolo y Shanahan guy in that yeah. drop back if a guy's open, bang, I'll hit him kind of yeah. thing. I, I think that's fair. I think that that's a that's a fine comparison. And if he becomes that, if that's his ceiling, cool. Jimmy G at his peak was a below average starter, I would say. At his peak, a below average to maybe average starter, right? Uh, and if you're saying Jimmy G with more mobility, then awesome. I don't think Michael Pratt is somebody that you're developing and expecting him to be the successor to Aaron Rodgers, but really most of the guys you're drafting at this stage aren't going to be. He's someone you're drafting and you're hoping can develop into a cheap and affordable young backup. That And that's that's valuable to have because if you can get a young backup quarterback on a, on a rookie contract, you're saving six, seven million dollars, whatever it's going to be. So I think that's valuable. Uh, I don't love really a lot of the quarterbacks in this middle range, which again, isn't surprising. It should not be, that should not be a shock uh, given the, the hit rate of these guys. One guy I'm looking at, and I know it has been connected to Jets a lot. They had a meeting with him is Jordan Travis from Florida state. Travis, is another guy who he lacks ideal size. He's not a very big guy. I don't think he has, I think his arm is fine. I don't think it's anything special. It's fine. He's a good athlete. The issue with him is one, he's an older prospect. He turns 24, I believe, a few days after the draft. And he's coming off a major leg injury, uh, which I don't know how the medicals are going to check out like that. Maybe it's a situation like a Hendon Hooker where he ends up sitting out a lot of his rookie season, but that's fine because the they Jets don't he's need- fine. I think the last attempt, the last uh, not attempt, the last you know news break I saw about him was that he's going to be okay for training camp, which is okay. good. It wasn't like a, I think he broke his leg is what it was. So I think if that... Yeah. He'll, it wasn't like a ten, like an ACL tear or an Achilles thing. So right. it seems like something you probably – not that this is obviously not easy to do at all, but yeah. it just sounds like if you're a professional-level athlete, you can recover in time to – We have we have news, Mike. We have Do news. we have news? The Carolina Panthers have signed Jadavian Clowney. Oh, really? The Carolina Panthers. Well, a week ago on this show, I said I predict the Jets will sign him. I was wrong. Uh, the Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers, who the Jets beat out for Mike Williams – uh, we're not going to be beaten out by the Jets multiple times. And the Carolina Panthers have signed Jadavian Clowney, according to Ian Rappaport. Uh, so, uh, brother. Oh, yeah, that no, sucks for the Ravens. What the hell are they going to do now? Yeah, you're a Ravens guy. That really does suck. I, I, I didn't think – it sounded like it was between the Jets and Panthers. So I'm not shocked that the Panthers signed him. I, it's unfortunate. I definitely would have loved the Jets to have signed Jadavian Clowney. I think that, you know, they're still going to be active in the, in the free agent edge rusher market. I honestly don't really know who's out there. Uh, I was really hoping they were going to sign Clowney, but that's something. All right. I know that the, the Panthers really wanted Mike Williams. So 
they they just weren't going to be outbid by the Jets twice. Um, we could talk about that more about that in a little bit because we're we're, we're going to talk about biggest needs that the the Jets still have to fill in free agency uh, right after this segment. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, I was just talking about Jordan Travis, and yeah, I I don't see the high end traits with him. I think he has a little bit higher of an upside than upside than Pratt, just because he's probably a better athlete. I think he's not that Pratt isn't good at creating outside the pocket because he can, but I think Travis can do more with his legs, especially if the medicals check out. And I think that gives him some developmental upside. He is a little bit older and he is coming off that, that injury. And I don't think he has elite physical traits, but I think he's someone that can end up having a good career in the NFL. And his timeline makes sense for the jets because if he is, you know, if he does take some time to recover, recover from that injury, the Jets don't need him to play at all in year one. He'll be QB three, and I think that that's fine. Uh, I think it's someone they can consider a fourth, fifth round pick. Like the the biggest strengths, I guess, that he has, he's very experienced. Of course, he's played, I believe, like four or five years in college. He started at Louisville before going to Florida State. Had a really, really good senior season before his his injury. High football IQ guy. Like I, I think he's someone that you want in your quarterback room. I'm not sure he's ever going to be a long term starter, but perfectly fine quarterback prospect to target and like fourth, fifth round. And I think that's somebody the Jets can keep their eye on. The thing with Travis too is I think a lot of people expected like Lamar Jackson-y creation ability. He's not really that. Like it's kind of yeah. weird. Like he's almost more of a power runner guy, but he doesn't have that sort of that sort yeah. of ability. Like they ran him a lot, almost like a running back at Florida State. Like the way they just used him on like QB power and stuff like that. And that's how I like the him. accuracy and I like the mindset too. Like it's not just like a dink and dunk guy. Like he's trying to make plays out there, which as we said before, I'd rather my quarterback try to make plays than just, you know, Derek Carr dink and dunk it all over the field. So I like that. I think he, I think he might be good on a team that uses the quarterback run a little bit more since that's a lot of his appeal. I just don't think the Jets really do that. I don't think Hackett is smart enough to even create like a – a package of Jordan Travis. But here's plays. the thing. If Nathaniel Hackett's still going to be the offensive coordinator by the time you would be hoping Jordan Travis is playing in a few years, I don't think so. You think when Rodgers is gone, the Hackett is still going to be here? I don't I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I never yeah. underestimate. Because if Rodgers does something really good and then he leaves, you don't think they're going to be like, oh, well, Hackett can stay. Because Hackett can go. He can be demoted to an office. They wanted their senior offensive assistant. That could be Nathaniel Hackett. Keep him on as a buddy-buddy thing. But no, I don't. I don't want him as the OC. I mean, I don't either, but we got to make our peace with it. So Travis would be good, but traits wise, he's more like a production guy over a traits guy. If you want a traits guy and purely a traits guy yeah. at this point in the draft, you're going to have to go look at Joe Milton uh, from Tennessee. Well, he didn't really play particularly well. Well, Anthony Richardson didn't like the run on fire either. He went number four overall because of traits. And Milton. Weird guy, back up at Michigan. He giant guy, 6'5, 240. Legitimately, too. Not like a fat guy either. That is muscle. 6'5, 240. Backed up at Michigan a bunch. Goes to Tennessee. And if you look at the numbers, they look pretty good. 30 touchdowns, five picks. And then he also ran for seven touchdowns. So you're like, wow, that's amazing. But it's the same thing when Hedden Hooker was coming out. Why well, I wasn't as high on Hedden Hooker as everybody else was. There's certain offenses that are just like fake and not real and, and Mickey Mouse offenses. Like Jets fans can remember when Bryce Petty came out of Baylor. If anybody saw those Baylor teams, you're like, this is barely even football. Yeah. This is this is like seven on seven. This is as close to like a seven on seven Canadian football as you could get. Like he's not making reads. He's not even throwing to particular receivers. He's throwing to spots and then a guy will be there. Not real football. Ole Miss is kind of like that, but a little bit less or so. Tennessee is a crime against football, humanity. It, it works. It works well at the college level, but it's a crime in terms of developing pro prospects because Milton is not asked to do anything post-snap, very little pre-snap. It's always like looking over at the sideline to figure out what the play is. They always snap the ball in 30 seconds, so there's not a ton of figuring out what the defense is actually doing. So – Going from that to even Hackett's Kitty Fisher Price playbook is going from pre algebra to high level calculus. That's just what you have to do. And he's also got accuracy concerns. Like he, I can't, I lost count how many times he would just airmail guys. Yep. And this is Tennessee. Everything was short. It was, you know, curls and slants and drags and screens. And then occasionally he'd go throw a bomb. But this is a pretty easy offense to be accurate in. And he wasn't. So why would you take him? Watch this dude throw the ball, man. You will see. 
I'm not even trying to exaggerate here. Day one, he comes in the league. In terms of just pure arm strength, like how far you can throw a ball, he might be top three. Yeah. Like it's that level. Of, he could throw a ball. I've seen him in a game throw it almost 70 yards in the air. Good velocity on lower throws, throws off balance, throws when he's getting hit. Like the arm is absolutely real. And even though he didn't run a lot, like big guy, you can't, you can't tell me he wouldn't be good running on some quarterback draws. I, I refuse to believe he's not a weapon in the run game. So if the Jets are operating purely on traits, they're going to look at Joe Milton's arm in a Hackenberg. Not like Hackenberg, because at least Milton at least had production in college, and Hackenberg didn't. The Jets drafted him because he had a good rivals recruiting page. Milton at least has an arm where you look at him and you go, whoa, this is this is insane. Yeah, in a day two, three, day two or day three quarterback class that – I would say lacks upside. There's not a lot of guys who I'm looking at and I'm like, they can develop into like a genuinely really good quarterback. Joe Milton stands out like, a, like he's like a, a sore thumb. Like he is the clearly the traits guy, clearly the upside guy. When you're looking at this day three quarterback class, he has, you know, all the tools, all the athleticism, anything that you could ever want. He's just completely unrefined. Um, the big ops, the, the, the big red flag with him to me when it comes to like, you know, cause you can take a guy, you could ch- take a chance on guys like that who have that upside. The big red flag to me is he's 24. He's has a ton of college experience and he really hasn't developed to this point. Now that's not being that's not me saying that I wouldn't take a chance on Joe Milton because why not just take a swing? Uh, I just you, you really I think he needs to go to the right situation to develop and and be as part of a be in a good situation with a good coaching staff and a good offense. I don't think the Jets are necessarily the best fit for him. Um, but if you send him to like Kansas City or something like that, maybe maybe he could develop into something. I don't know. I mean, not that they need you know, him to develop into a starting quarterback in Kansas City, but maybe he develops into an asset for them. I don't know. But I love the upside with Joe Milton. I feel like he almost has like Baker May- May- Baker Mayfield arm where it's like dude's always throwing a-, a thousand miles per hour for no reason. It's like chill out. But it's a stronger arm than Baker too, which is yeah, what well, it is. More fighting what I'm saying is like zero touch, like just always throwing it a- a- or like Josh Allen coming out of Wyoming. Like, like dude has zero touch. He's just always throwing the same speed at all times. And that's fine. Like the dude's got an arm. He's got a cannon, but chill out. I mean, I would do that too. If I had that arm, I don't blame me, right. Joe. <laughs> I feel like he's just showing off. Like it'll be a little th- three yard drag over the middle. And he's throwing it 80 miles per hour. And it's like, you're trying to decapitate your receiver. Calm do, down. Joe. Do you remember there was an old power raid commercial with Michael Vick where he drinks power raid. It's filming like a, almost like an old camcorder thing. Cause it looks like real. And yeah. a guy just he's just throwing a pro day, and a guy catches it, and he goes gets knocked back ten yards whenever he catches it. That's and then crazy. a guy's like, "Go long, go long!" And he, he's in the coliseum, and he just throws the ball out of the coliseum. That's I, Joe Milton. Yeah, that that checks out. Uh, real quick, Sal asked, "Did I miss you guys talking about Clowning the Panthers?" We mentioned it briefly. We're gonna talk about it a little bit more in depth in a second. We're just gonna quickly blaze through my last mid round quarterback prospect that the Jets could target, but then we'll talk about Clowney uh, in a moment. Um, the last guy that I'm looking at is again, it's not a great mid round quarterback class. Not that there really ever is a great mid round quarterback class, but somebody who I think has the arm talent, especially more than a guy like Michael Pratt or even Jordan Travis is Carter Bradley from, from South Alabama. He is the son of Gus Bradley, the former Jaguars head coach who also uh, coached Robert Sala in Jacksonville. So Sala has ties to Gus Bradley. I believe they remain close friends to this day. So Maybe this is a situation where nepotism comes into play and the Jets target a Carter Bradley because, hey, Sala knew him when he was a kid and he seems like a good guy and whatever. Um, Bradley, that's another very – organizations run things, by the way. That's how – I mean, that's the NFL. <laughs> that's, that's how the world runs, Mike. Uh, but I yeah, know, I mean, but it, sports should not be the – sports isn't the world. You got to operate differently. It is. It is. Sports are a microcosm of the world. If you really Most jobs it. in the world are also – can't pay you $48 million in three years. You got to operate differently. But, why, why, Mike, why does Nathaniel Hackett have a job right now? He, he has a job because of two forms of nepotism. <laughs> That's why I'm so screaming mad at. What's the guy? It's a movie. I'm mad as hell and it's, I can't take it anymore. That's me. Oh, yeah. It's just reality, though. But Bradley's another really experienced quarterback. I believe he started at Toledo. He's been playing college ball, I think, since like 2017 or 18. He's been around for a long time, already 24 years old. But because of that, he's a pretty refined quarterback. Uh, the thing with him is you're not going to get athleticism. He is a like strictly pocket passer. He's not somebody who's going to be able to create out, outside of a structure too often. He is as old school of a drop back quarterback as there is in this draft class. And I think he's that's fine because he has a really good arm. And I think he's a 
relatively polished quarterback. I said this to you right before the show. I get some Josh Rosen vibes with him, like in the same archetype. Obviously, Josh Rosen, much higher or much highly, more highly touted prospect. Didn't really work out in the NFL, but kind of cut from the same cloth as, you know, I think he's a pretty good processor. I think he has as good, if not better, of an arm than Josh Rosen. Because I think Carter Bradley's got a very, very good arm. He's just the athleticism there, you know, is not there with him. And also, I don't think you really get much creativity. He's not going to extend plays outside the pocket, which I don't know what the Jets are looking for. But I think because of that Gus Bradley, Robert Sala connection, there's a chance they take a chance on him. I, I think he's probably more of like fifth, sixth, seventh round. I don't think he's going to be like third or fourth round. But another guy to keep an eye on. He, I think he has the arm talent for the NFL, even if the athleticism is really lacking by modern standards. To my dying day, I will never understand Josh how Rosen. it all went so wrong for Josh Rosen so yeah. quickly. Yeah, I, does, does it does it didn't make any, it looked like two different guys, like nothing he did it good at UCLA translated. It was yep. so it was sad. Let me be honest, it was sad. Yeah, but I, I, I love Josh Rosen. I loved him coming out of college. I didn't Josh see Rosen do that year. Yeah, Josh Rosen forever the whole Josh Rosen Josh Allen situation forever changed the way that I evaluate quarterback prospects. I, I at that point when Josh Allen hit and Josh Rosen busted and failed miserably, forever since that point I've been like, well, you know, if a guy's got traits, take a chance on him. I don't give a shit. Like I, I like I don't care if they have traits, they could become Josh Allen. Awesome. Are they going to become Tyree Jackson? Maybe, but they have a chance to become Josh Allen. I'm taking a chance on that guy. That's why you know Joe what changed Miller my mind was. Do you remember Troy Smith at Ohio State? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're, you were before me that I was not watching college football. Because well, Troy football. Smith, I remember, because I, I was just starting to get into the draft when I was young. I just got into it that early. And he was just destroying at Ohio State. And then I remember when the draft came around, like, yeah, he might he might get drafted possibly. I'm like, yeah. huh? <laughs> and that that was like, okay, I gotta I gotta figure this out. Something's not right here. Yep. That was my that was my moment. So moving off that, we'll get into our init- biggest needs right now for the Jets because one of them could have been edge rusher, uh, but Jadavian Clowney is no longer going to the Jets. He's going to the Carolina Panthers, a two-year deal worth up to $24 million, which is a lot of money, especially because he signed a one-year $2 million prove-it deal with the Ravens last year. Right. And now he's now he's back with the Panthers. So I don't think the Jets were going to go $12 million. Real, real quick, that, that was Jordan Schultz from Bleach Report reported that the Jets, the sticking point for the Jets was they didn't want that second year. They they won one year contract, which makes sense. I'm surprised Clowney got this much. I think he deserves it. I just based on what his market was last year, I didn't think he would get much more than that. But hey, last year he signed for one year, significantly less money, or not significantly, but definitely less money. This is 10 million a year, up to potentially 12 million a year, I think. So I I would have done that. Eh. I would be willing to pay that price if I was the Jets. I think I can understand why they didn't want to do the two years because especially if they still have any faith in Will McDonald signing Clowney for two years, I get why they don't want to do that. But it's a big loss. Like, I think Clowney would have been a huge addition. It's just – it's tough, too, for the Jets and the Ravens specifically because they're, they're going to start Odafe Alway and David Ojabo right now at their defensive end spots, which is – And they drafted not- both of them. Yeah, they drafted both of them. Ojabo never plays and always got, like, what, 10 sacks in three years? So not good for them, not good for the Jets. But I think uh, does it even really need to be said that another edge rusher is one of their holes? Like, yeah. obviously, with the with Bryce Huff leaving, that's going to create a hole. I know they want Will McDonald to be the starter. He's going to be the starter, and Jermaine Johnson's really good. But with how much they rotate guys, they needed one more – they didn't even need necessarily a clowny guy. I mean, he would have been ideal just because of his history and his run defense, but they needed another guy who can come in and spell McDonald. I think maybe a kind of like a clowny ish run defender guy, just because McDonald, I think, is so pass rush specific. Mm-hmm. They might need to get another guy's good stuff in the run, especially because that's what they lacked last year. You know, they were a much better team defending the pass than they were defending the run. Uh, they're running out of options there. Maybe this is like a day three, day two, excuse me, third round pick that they go to. Like, there were a ton of guys like Marshawn Nealon or Brandon Dorless who are kind of, I keep calling them John Franklin Myers because that's the kind of guy they need. They need one more John Franklin Myers. Kind of a two-way, move them around, run stuffer guy. Free agency market's drying up, obviously, and Clowney would have been the best one. But if I'm Joe Douglas, I at least got to get one of them before I just call time on the, on the offseason. Yeah, I, I quickly pulled up the uh, the list of free agent edge rushers because I'm honestly not familiar with who else was out there. A couple of names that stood out. Again, I can't say I watched all these guys last year, so I need to do some research to know how 
you know, how good some of these guys still are. Uh, Calais Campbell, I think, is still a very good player. I'm pretty sure he was still really good. Campbell would definitely fit that, like, GFM role. He's more of a D tackle, I guess, at this stage, but he can – he has the versatility to play both. Jets were interested in him last year. I wouldn't be surprised if they go after him again if he still wants to play in 2024. Um, Yannick Ngakwe, I'm not sure what else he has left in the tank. I just looked up some of his numbers from last year, the last couple years. They're not particularly pretty. I know he had a lot of sacks in 2022, but his pressure numbers were way down. He had 12 sacks and 44 pressures. That is a ridiculous rate that clearly was not going to hold up. Uh, and he had 34 <laughs> pressures last year and only four sacks. So that that's more like it. Um, also missed a ridiculous amount of tackles. So I'm not sure how high I am on Ngakwe, although I believe he crossed paths with Sala in Jacksonville. So uh, Weren't the Jets going hard after him for a while? They might have been. They might have been. Um, other was guys would with the Raiders or something like that. Cause I remember for a while it was all in Gawkway to the Jets. That was a thing. Yeah. He's bounced around a ton. There's uh, some guys with Jets connections on the market. Of course, Carl Lawson, I don't expect him to be back, but he's still out there. Uh, Shaq Lawson who hates the Jets is also a former jet. He's still out there. Uh, Henry Anderson, old friend. He's out there. There's another John Franklin Myers type. Uh, also another John Franklin Myers type. Who's a former jet. Kyle Phillips is a free agent. Uh, the options aren't great. Justin Houston. I think. What did he have left in the tank with the Dolphins last year? I think he's all right. Like, obviously, you, I you for, saw him. I forgot game. he played last year. Yeah. He had he half played. a sack in seven games. Well. With the what Panthers. Were, what, were, what were some of his pressure numbers? Or was it the Panthers? Well, I imagine not very – you've got half a sack. Again, imagine you're not, like, getting Bryce Huff pressure numbers. But I think he was with the Dolphins. He was very briefly. He just didn't record any stats. Yeah, 10 pressures. Not great. Uh, well, on 112 pass rush snaps, that's not all. I, I all think right. it's time for Houston to go be a family man, from me and us. Yeah, the options are not particularly great when looking at the rest of the free option for agent market. Bud Dupree, uh, Jerry Hughes, like definitely guys past their prime. Randy Gregory maybe could be an option. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Then you get off the field stuff with him. I know, but he's, I think, stayed clean recently. Um, but, yeah, I, I honestly – Mike. Bud Dupree could be okay, I'm actually. Gonna, I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to throw it out there. Do you think there's any chance the Jets take an edge rusher at 10? Or if they trade down in the first round, take an edge rusher? If they trade down and maybe they use a top fit, like they get like a second round pick, maybe that's what they do with it. You don't think first round is even a slimmer possibility? Unless I like I Dallas Turner a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think he might be the best defensive player in this class. So, I mean, it's not a super high-end defensive class. So that's right. not. So option. if they want to talk themselves into, we got the best defensive player in the class at ten. I that could be very easy to talk yourself into because he is. Will McDonald was a little bit of a scheme reach. T yeah. Turner is like he's set him and forget him ten sacks every year. And he's a much better, much more polished run defender than McDonald is right now. Exactly. Out, out younger too, like. Yeah. That might be the only guy where I could like if they, if they get like Laya Tulatu who's got medical things too. I'm like I don't yeah. know if that's or yeah. like Jared Jared Verse. Jared Ver Verse is I used to like I used yeah. to not be. And obviously the Jets don't need an edge rusher, but I'm like man, if you need one, like go watch a game against Florida. It's literally like just a a bludgeoning. It's like an old Viking just chopping a guy's head off. It's just embarrassing for Florida. So if you watch that yeah. game, you'd be like, all right, maybe I'll take Verse. Losing Claudio really sucks. That would have filled a huge, huge hole in that. I always team. thought he was kind. Of, that was kind of unattainable, though, just because I'd he'd be like in such. A, he'd be in like kind of a rotation -y role, and I feel like after that year, he might want a little more. Plus, he gets to go back home. He's from South Carolina too. So well, sure, it seemed like the Jets had a, were felt pretty good about it. That's it seemed like they felt pretty good about it. But obviously, that second year was the sticking point. They weren't going to give him a two year contract. And I don't blame them for that. Uh, it, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they address edge rusher going forward because I don't expect Will McDonald to be playing 60% of snaps next year. I, I just I don't think that's going to happen. You have Jermaine Johnson still. You have John Franklin Myers still. Maybe they just keep JFM more on the edge. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what they do. They have D-tackle depth, I guess. They brought in Kinlaw. They brought back Thomas. They, they, you know, the, the nose tackle from Arizona, which I forget how to pronounce it. Lefty Fo Lecky Fotu, I believe. Is George name? Lecky Fotu. <laughs> George Lecky Fotu, yeah. So I, I think that... You know, they have, they still have plenty of pieces on that D line, but they definitely need, they're going to add another edge rusher at some point. And maybe, maybe it opens up the possibility of doing it late in day one or day two. I, I think that absolutely is a possibility. Another position that we should talk about, because that's, you know, it's a lot of clowny talk. It's unfortunate that they, they lost out on clowny. Another position I want to talk about that I still think the Jets are going to target, and I, I keep saying this, is running back. 
I, I, I would be very surprised. I'd be stunned. No, I don't want to say stunned. I'd be very surprised if Izzy Abanacanda was RB2 going into next season. That's not a knock on Izzy. I don't think we saw much of him last season. And I also don't think he's really the, the – I don't think he fills the role that they need from their RB2 right now. I don't think he's nearly as good in pass protection. In fact, that's what kept him off the field for a lot of last year. Uh, he's definitely more of a change of pace breakaway guy that you're hoping can develop into more. He's bigger than a lot of like those those like scat back change of pace guys, but he's not a refined running back at this point. And he's not somebody that if Brees were to go down, I would feel comfortable at all with him as your top running back. Not, not even close. So I think this is very, very likely, very likely chance that the Jets sign a veteran running back. A guy like you know, Deontay. You know who's actually out there and could be a really good signing is um he was on the Ravens last year. They got this guy Dalvin Cook, who uh I know he struggled dare. last year, but <laughs> uh, uh, don't you dare, Mike. The Cowboys might sign him, which is hilarious, dude. Uh why would I, anyone he, sign him? He's done. He's he's cooked. He was cooked he's before done. the Jets got him, and he's definitely cooked now. I right, so wasn't that cooked. So, yeah. He was cooked. He was cooked, goddammit. I said it for months. He was cooked. And let me let me take my victory lap, all right? Um, but no, the Jets are going to bring back Dalvin Cook. Uh, I would have loved Deontay Foreman. Unfortunately, he signed, I forget where, actually, but I know he's gone. He signed with somebody. Um, I would have loved him. Damian Harris was somebody else who I thought made some sense if the medicals checked out. He just retired because would likely – believe it if I said he signed with the Browns? Deontay Foreman? Yes, I would. I remember that. Yeah. I remember him playing around. As a Jerome Ford Dynasty fantasy owner, I wasn't happy about that. But yeah. – what do we Actually, do I want to go to a comment from James Gilby in chat because he this has a the guy idea of Ezekiel Elliott. This was the guy I was about to mention. I like Ezekiel Elliott as a target for the Jets. I think that he's still getting probably more hate than he deserves. I don't think he's as cooked as Dalvin was when the Jets signed him. And I also think the way that he runs and his style and his strengths are a much better fit for what the Jets need than Dalvin Cook. Current, present day Ezekiel Elliott is not Ezekiel Elliott from six years ago. Not even close. He's not nearly as – not that he was ever the most explosive running back, but most of the explosiveness that he still had is gone. The difference is Dalvin Cook's calling card was his explosiveness. When you took away that, when you removed that explosiveness, he had nothing left to offer. He was not a good pass catcher. He had fumble issues. He was not a good pass blocker. He was definitely not somebody that was going to ever excel in short yarded situations. Ezekiel Elliott can still do that stuff. He can still fill a role that the Jets need as a good pass blocker, a, a – solid pass catcher, a very underrated pass catcher throughout his career, and somebody who can still do well in short yardage situations. And I think that's what the Jets really need. You're not signing Zeke to take away, you know, 40% of snaps from Brees Hall. You're you're signing him to hopefully fill that that void in, in you know, short yardage situations in the red zone as maybe a third down pass blocking back, third and one. That's when you want Ezekiel Elliott in the game. And I'm okay with that. And also, you don't even need to take Brees Hall at the field for that. You can have both of them on the field at the same time. It's not an anti Brees Hall thing. It's just I want a little bit more insurance behind Brees Hall. And I think I think Ezekiel Elliott would fill that role a lot more than somebody like Izzy Abanacanda could. Who Izzy can still get a couple of snaps a game, but he's not somebody who's going to be able to do the things that that Zeke can at this stage. See, I, I'm an Abanacanda fan, and I just feel like with how much I want the Jets to ride Brees this year, like I mentioned the just before the show, I want him getting Larry Johnson in 2005 and six level of touches. Now, maybe that's not a good idea because Larry Johnson is now a legitimate psychopath, crazy person, got arrested a bunch of times, and Herm Edwards probably has something to do with that. But, <laughs> like, the level, I want Brees Hall touching the ball 20 times every game. And I feel like if a Banacanda, if a Banacanda comes in and gets maybe four or five touches a game, I feel like as a fifth round pick in year two, I feel like that shouldn't be too tall of a task. Now, I would love Zeke coming in just because I like Zeke. As a player, thought he was pretty okay last year. I know New England had a ton of stuff going on that was not his fault that he had to go deal with. Yeah. But I just with, – with what the Jets need, because they also, I think, need to defend – we'll get into this later. I think they maybe need another safety. You know, they could use some more depth, maybe on the offensive line, maybe one more backup. If you have a limited number of funds to spend, I would rather it go there than a backup just because – we talk the running back is kind of making a comeback a little bit with how many guys got paid this offseason with Derrick Henry being what he is, or Christian McCaffrey being what he is. Like running backs are kind of in vogue right now. <laughs> and for a Jets team that I know they got Mike Williams, but Brees Hall is going to touch the ball more than any other player except Rodgers on that on that team. Yeah. I find it weird to take him off the field and be like, all right, let's go and give this veteran guy who's lost his burst, admittedly lost his burst. 
Sure. Some touches because I remember, because also I don't necessarily trust Hackett to come up with a good running back rotation. Because at least with, with Brees and Abandacanda, Brees is the one they're going to ride him. Like, but there were, t- remember that Cowboys game when Dalvin Cook got more touches than Brees? Yeah. I don't think that, I don't think that'll happen again. But I mean, they were, that was, Bre- Brees Hall was on a snap count. That's, that's what that was. Brees, Brees Hall was on a snap count early in the year. They, they're not going to do that to him next year. He is the by far obvious RB one. Like he is the guy that they're going to, the, the focal point of the offense. He's the guy that they're going to build the offense around. They'll I don't turn think, him loose. I don't think signing anybody changes that fact. I, I you know, unless you sign like Derrick Henry, which as much as I would have loved that, they were never going to pay the money to get Derrick Henry, nor should they have, because that's not the, the best allocation of funds, even though selfishly, I thought he would have been an awesome fit with the Jets. I, I think well, so. for now the Ravens just lost all their offensive line, didn't replace them. So. And he did. He's, he's going to deal with what he dealt with last year in Tennessee. But yeah, I, I, still I good though. That's the thing because he's, he's so good. good. He is still good. He is still good. I, I think again, the difference between Zeke and, and Dalvin is just that Zeke. Well, one again, you're not signing Dalvin. You're not signing Zeke to fill the role that you signed Dalvin to fill last year because Dalvin was signed as insurance for Brees Hall coming off a torn ACL. That's not the situation here. You are signing Zeke and saying you are the defined RB2. You are to spell Brees Hall in specific situations where we want you to be in there. And you're an insurance policy in case Brees goes down. Because I just look, Mike, I, I and I like the Isaiah Banacana coming to college. I've seen nothing at this point that says that he should be RB2 next year. I, nothing. I don't, I don't think it's wise or smart to go into next year with him as your top backup, your top insurance policy behind Brees Hall, because it's really rare for running backs to play 17 games in, in a season. There's a lot of running back injuries out there. It happens every single year. I do not think the Jets trust Izzy Vanakanda to be their RB2 next year. Like they didn't trust him last year. Why would they trust him this year? And it's not even just like the talent levels, like it's pass blocking, it's fumble concerns. It's stuff like that, where it's just like, give me a guy who I know isn't going to have those issues. Zeke does not have pass blocking issues. He does not have fumble concerns. That's why I'd be in favor of that. I wouldn't be shocked if they go the draft route as well, but I think it just makes sense to bring a veteran in there. Um, and I also think you can still sign Zeke to, what, a one-year, $2 million contract and still address other needs. I mean, James asks about safety position. We could talk about that because I know you did want to mention safety briefly. Um, James on, on Twitter, if this is going to show up, he does, it does. He asked, what do you guys think about a safety position? I want Ashton back. I think the Jets want Ashton back as well. The, the question is, does Ashton does Davis want to be back? come back to the Jets? I think in a perfect world or in a perfect world for the Jets, he will be back. Um, Ashton Davis, by all accounts right now, I believe it was reported by uh, Zach Rose of The Athletic, is that he's looking for a starting job, a starting opportunity elsewhere. And I don't blame him. I, I think that he earned an increased role after what he did last season. But the Jets definitely want him back. And if the opportunity isn't there for him elsewhere, I think he will end up being back, especially with the new kickoff rule. I think it's even more important to bring back a guy like Ashton Davis, who is a, a standout special teams player, as well as someone like Justin Hardy, who the Jets have also not brought back to this point. I imagine it's a money thing there, uh, but I think they should definitely prioritize bringing both of those guys back for the, I mean, obviously just for special teams, but Davis, sure, you need to add to your safety room because right now you have Chuck Clark and Tony Adams, and they used a lot of three safeties last year. So Ashton Davis makes sense. I've mentioned to Sean Gibson as a possibility for a couple months now, I think. Uh, he, he played in San Francisco, not under Robert Sala, but in a similar scheme under D'Amico Ryans. And I think that even though he's like 34 years old, he makes some, he makes sense as some guy you could bring in where he has a ton of experience. He could be that third safety option, kind of what you, what you wanted Adrian Amos to be last year before Ashton Davis took his job. Um, if they don't bring back Davis, I think someone like Gibson makes sense. They will add something there. It could be in the draft. Uh, I just, I'd be surprised because right now their third safety is Jark Bernard Converse. And I just, I think it's a situation like Izzy where they're not going to trust him as your top backup safety going into the season. I'd be surprised. What do you think about Julian Blackman? He is still out there, isn't he? He's a younger He's still out there. And if they were going to pay Clowney, probably eight figures, that, because the sticking point was the Jets didn't want to do two years. But if yeah. the Jets are willing to give him probably eight figures for one year, that suggests they could probably go eight figures with Blackman too. He's still it's, out there. He had four picks last year for the Colts. I don't think they would Chris go that Bradley high. Cover three. It's not the same system, but it's similar. I don't think they'd go that high for him, but also if you just saw what Cameron Curl got on the open market, I don't even know. I have no idea what the safety market is. Like I, I, I have no prediction because Cameron Curl got Xavier McKinney got like 16 million a year. Right. And Cam Curl got what? Like 5 million a year? Four and a half. Four and a half. Cam Curl. I don't think it's a hot take to say Cam Curl is just as good as Xavier McKinney or at least in the same tier. How the hell did one of those guys get like, that's insane to me. So if Cam Curl's getting that, I don't want the Jets paying Julian Blackman 
what near the like, close to what Connie got. I know. Let it down the middle. I, I, I think if they sign a safety and free agency, it'll be a $2 million contract. I don't think they're going to invest anything significant. The only, you know, maybe Davis, Ashton Davis would probably be get the most, but I don't think they sign an external guy for more than what they pay Ashton Davis. And I, I think that might be all of the main needs that get locked yeah. up. They get another I, safety. Definitely offensive tackle depth. Like we could throw others out there. We don't have to talk about it, but offensive tackle depth. I think they need to, to make another move there. Carter Warren is fine. Again, I think it's another situation where you cannot go into next year with him as your primary backup tackle. Carter Warren, I don't know. I, like I know some Jets fans are high in his potential. He was not good last year. He allowed sacks at a higher rate than Mekhi Becton. Like he was, he was not good, which is to be expected for a guy who was a mid-round developmental prospect who missed most of the summer due to an injury and also was asked to play right tackle after play, previously playing left tackle. And he wasn't really supposed to play anyway. He wasn't. I'm not surprised at all he was bad, but there's nothing where you could see from Carter Warren's tape last year that makes me think, oh, yeah, he should be the backup tackle next year, like the top backup tackle. And I'm not talking a Billy Turner edition. I still want David Bakhtiari. I think that would make sense. But either way, I think they still got to add somebody there. Um, yeah, safety. Oh, receiver. They definitely get another receiver. I don't think Alan Lazard should be your wide receiver three. And at the very least, it, your three and four should not be Lazard and Xavier Gibson going into next year, especially given Mike Williams coming off torn ACL. He has the injury concerns. I don't want to be one Mike Williams injury away from having Alan Lazard and, and Xavier Gibson as your wide receiver two, wide receiver three again. And with that, we bring on the return of the weekly draft spotlight. It's been a while, mostly just because we've had other pressing matters come up in terms of signings and trades and it was better. I mean, last year we could also keep doing it because it was just we didn't want to talk about leverage with Aaron Rodgers every single week. So that helped, that helped. But wait, it's really, back. Really, quick, really quick. I feel bad because Brian, this is, this is a good comment from Brian. But right, right before we get into this, he asked about James Conn. I do want to. I do want to. We don't have to talk about this long, but uh, Brian in chat said, "I don't particularly have a favorite among remaining free agent running backs. Would you be interested in trading for James Conner? He cost four point five million in twenty twenty four. I, I think James Conner was genuinely really good last year. I think he's he's a very underrated running back." I don't think the Jets are going to pay four point five million for a backup running back. I, I just, I, as good as he is, I think the, I don't think Connor would be would want to go to the Jets because I think he's a starting running back. Like I, I don't think I don't feel like the Cardinals even want to trade him. Yeah, I also don't know if the Cardinals want to trade him. I love the player. I, I think James Connor is a very good player and very underrated. I just for the Jets, it feels like a weird fit because you're paying a good amount of money for a backup running back who probably shouldn't be a backup running back. And if you got James Connor. Like you, you want to play him probably more than fifteen percent of snaps, like and twenty percent of snaps. And I just, I don't think I want that with Brees there. But I do love the player, and I do love the idea. Maybe it is a situation where the Jets explore the the trade market, or maybe you know, further as we get into training camp, they look at some guys who are still out there, guys who end up getting cut. Maybe that's something they could do. But I do love the player, and that's a good suggestion. Anyway, sorry. Go draft with that. We got the weekly draft spotlight back. Uh, I'm gonna go look at the defensive back defensive back this week uh and it's a guy who is built to play for robert sala and that's uh jaden hicks of washington state he's been a late riser it seems like a lock he's going to be a day two guy at this point i'll get the negatives out of the way first because he is slow for a safety he's like a four six guy uh and his shuttle was like 16th percentile for safeties which is not what you want you want in short area quickness and uh, he can play a little too out of control sometimes. Like it's a lot of those, you know, go for the big hit instead of wrapping up kind of guys. And then they just bounce off him and then he keeps going. But he has the two things that Robert Sala wants. He wants you to be really smart, good football IQ. And he wants you to play like your hair's on fire. And my God, does he do that? He is. Yeah. Whoa. What is what did that what happened? What was that? If you do all right, for those watching the YouTube stream, if you do the peace sign, apparently Apple has this thing where certain gestures come up and it makes balloons drop oh that. whoa that's yeah great. i gotta turn that off because it's just derailing the stream but <laughs> love that but right, now so that i've turned audio, that off it's called audio listeners, are, audio listeners are super confused but yeah, yeah i know this is great audio this is great radio but <laughs> for the youtube guys i don't know why that but anyway hicks is my god does he play fast does he hit hard he's built almost like one of those kind of hybrid linebackery guys like jamie and sherwood Hamza and osraldine that Sala and Douglas obviously like adding, and he's great in run support. Well, maybe the best run support safety in this entire class. Big hitter, strong guy, 6'2", 215. 
violent, loves contact, but also like good burst. He's got he's not like the best long speed guy, but he's got good burst. Creates turnovers, sacks guys like in a weak safety class cuz I don't think there's going to be a first round safety taken. I mean, Tyler Newbin in from Minnesota might be the only one who's got a shot and even then I think he might go like early second. Newbin might be like the second or third safety off the board. So the Jets can fill their safety hole and get a guy who fits in schematically with what they want to do. And you know what? Maybe, just maybe, they could do some Dayom Buchanan stuff. Maybe they can burn the linebacker full time. It's a very versatile piece for a date for a third round guy. Yeah, admittedly, I'm not too familiar with with uh, with him, honestly. But I, I, he definitely sounds like somebody that they would probably convert to linebacker full time. Seems like he has the, the same physical archetype as a guy like Hamza Najulin or Jamie Sherwood, or even like a Marcel Harris. Remember Marcel Harris? Salah loves those safety to linebacker converts, and I, I think that's somebody they they can definitely consider. I, I think their linebacker. I, I just keep calling them all day. Dayon Buchanan was not an amazing player, but like that's just Isaiah Simmons. I know. Isaiah Simmons is like the more recent example of that. Mark Barron. If you remember Mark Barron. <laughs> Mark Barron. Yeah. With Tampa. Yeah. I think Simmons is like the most recent example of that. Oh, but he's also just such a physical freak, Isaiah Simmons. But yeah, I think it makes sense because Salah loves guys like that. And I think he is a Robert Sala fit. Um, whether they end up going that route or not, I'm not sure that would really address safety as much as it would linebacker, but a chess piece for Robert Sala's defense is never a bad thing. Um, the guy that I'm taking a look at this week, and I always just talked a lot about running backs. I'm going to be talking about a running back here because what if the Jets don't sign anybody? What if they don't sign Ezekiel Elliott? What if they don't sign Kareem Hunt or whoever is out there, right? And they go into the draft. I think somebody that makes a ton of sense that fits the exact archetype that they should be looking for is Audric Estime from Notre Dame. Now, immediately. Gold Domer. Like, yep. Yeah, what was, what'd you say? Gold Domer, Notre Dame. Yeah. Yes. Is he related to, remember Brizzly Estime? Does that name ring a bell to you? No. Okay. <laughs> All right, you don't have to get so worked up. <laughs> Grizzly estimate like was a Syracuse receiver who had a cup of coffee with the Jets. I don't know why I just thought about it. How but. am I possibly supposed to internalize that? I don't know, man. You know a lot about football players. <laughs> I don't know if that name or if you remember that name. Okay, I stopped it. I got gotcha. you. Uh, I don't know if you really <laughs> estimate. Sure. Either way, Audrey estimate I think makes a ton of sense for the Jets. Immediately, people have an impression of him because. He did not have a great combine. He, he had a, a 40 yard dash of, I believe it was 4.71 uh, 40 yard dash, which is quite bad. Very bad, one might say, for a running back. However, measured in a lot or recorded a lot better time in his pro day, which not a surprise. Usually the pro day times are better, but I believe it was like 4.58, significantly better 40 time at his, at his pro day. And I also, getting the sense, like I, watching him, I never got the sense that he was too slow for the NFL. He's never going to be a breakaway speed guy, but that's. That's not his calling card. That doesn't need to be his thing. I never got the sense that he was just too slow. Uh, honestly, kind of reminds me a bit of like a David Montgomery or like a Jamal Williams or even like a little bit slower Jonathan Stewart. Like those are the vibes that I get when I watch him. Specifically Montgomery, I think is is a really good comp for me. Uh, really just a powerful, powerful running back, strong lower body, strong legs, 5'11", 221. Also, I believe he's a local guy too. He, he grew up in... He was born in Nyack, New York, which is like Westchester, Rockland County area. But he went to school in Montvale, New Jersey. So that's like 30 minutes or so from East Rutherford. That's right there in northern New Jersey. Carter Warren was a local guy, too, and you hate him. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't hate Carter. Hold on a second. It's funny because so is Izzy Abanacanda, and I've talked shit about Paul. Oh, yeah, you're right. He's from Brooklyn, yeah. <laughs> but I don't hate Carter Warren or Izzy Abanacanda. I just don't think they should be counted on as the top backups at their position just yet. Continue to develop them. Maybe they become contributors. Maybe they don't. But look, would you have, after LaMichael P. Ryan's rookie season, would you have been happy with LaMichael P. Ryan as RB2 going into his second year? No, and you shouldn't have been, right? That's not saying Izzy Abanacanda is going to be LaMichael P. Ryan, but we don't know what he's going to be. Anyway, back to Audric Estime, uh, highly productive two-year starter or contributor, whatever you want to call it, rushed for th over 1,300 yards last year, 18 touchdowns, 6.4 yards per carry. I think he's one of the best contact balance runners in this class. Never going to go down on first contacts, always running through arm tackles. Honestly, some of his like highlight real runs at Notre Dame, they're like Marshawn Lynch-esque. Like I'm, I'm dead serious when I say that. Dude is a tank. He is a beast. Uh, the biggest knock against him, of course, is his speed. Uh, that 4 7 one, 40 yard dash to the combine is something that teams are going to look at. But I think he, land, he, he definitely ran a lot better at his pro day. And I just – I didn't get 471 speed like watching him on tape. I think he has better speed 
uh, than the especially better long speed. Like I think it takes him a little bit to get into that high gear, but once he's there, I think he has better speed than that number would indicate. Uh, also, some comparable 40s. David Montgomery, you know, I, I mentioned David Montgomery. He ran a 4 6 3 40 at the combine. Jamal Williams David Montgomery had a little bit more like wiggle to him, though. Like, Estime is not sure. slow. It, like, he, straight north and south, he's fast. It's just yeah. going sideways is the problem. I, I agree. And I don't think, I, I don't think, I don't know if Audrey Estime is going to be David Montgomery, but I could see, I could see shades of that. I could see shades of Jamal Williams, who ran a 4 5 9, downhill, decisive runner. And honestly, with the Jets kind of shifting to more likely more of a power run scheme with with Morgan Moses coming in with Tyron Smith with John Simpson, I think he's a much better fit in that scheme than he would be in like a zone based scheme because you want a guy that can just run north south downhill decisive runner who can hit the hole and I think that's what Audrey has to make it do. I think he really fits well in a power scheme. To me, he is what the Jets should be looking for in an RB two. Also. I think he's an underrated pass catcher. They didn't really throw to him a lot in Notre Dame, but I don't think he, I, I don't believe he had a single drop in his college career. Again, they didn't throw the ball a lot to him, but also a solid well, pass. I think there's a reason they didn't throw the ball a lot to him. He was productive when they did. I just think it's something that they didn't know he could do. Or look, look at you want like look at Justin Herbert at Oregon and, and say like oh remember that was the whole knock at him like oh there's a reason they didn't have him do all this stuff. Well, maybe the coaching staff just didn't evaluate their player correctly. Well, I guess the thing though too is Notre Dame and the Notre Dame did throw to their back. Like Chris Tyree is like one of the best pass catching backs sure. in the leagues and and in the league exactly. in the country. So, right, and maybe that's why they weren't throwing to Estime as much. They didn't think he could do it, but clearly he's never had an issue doing it. I think that's an underrated part of his game because I never, in any of the stuff that I watched, he never had an issue pass catching. Or and I believe he never had a single drop during his time at Notre Dame. Also a fine pass blocker. I think Estime is a really good target on like. The early day three, maybe like the fourth round. Uh, I, I know that that people will be turned off by the the forty time, but I think that he plays faster than that forty time, and he is exactly the type of archetype the Jets should be looking for. Uh, I I don't even want to give him like an AJ Dillon comparison because I think he's a better. I don't know if he's a better athlete than Dillon, but I think he has a higher upside than AJ Dillon, who's really just he's a guy who's going to get you three yards of carry every single time, whether it's a third and one or whether it's first and ten, he's going to get you three yards of carry. I think Estime could do more than that. Well, I'm not scared about the. I'm scared about the fumbles. Is what I'm scared about. Yeah, sure. a lot of them, and in big games. Sure. Yep. And I fair. feel like if Notre Dame had a professional, like I feel like they would have thrown the ball to him more than 26 times in two years, if he had that level oh, yeah. of receiving talent. He had like 17 catches last year, or something like that. And he had nine the year before that, where he was the, the year before that, he was pretty much only a like a cha- like a short yardage well, guy. He had he pretty much guy. only had like the one year as like a high end starter. Well, they, they, he split carries that first year with with um, was it Logan Diggs. Was that his name? The guy who went to LSU. Maybe you player. know who he reminds me of? Josh Adams, another Notre Dame guy. Okay, Josh Adams is bigger. Josh Adams like six two, but I, yeah, I think Adams might be a little fat. Like, what was Adams forty time? I feel like he was faster. Am I misremembering that? Possibly. Yeah, I don't he was, know. He was four four five one. So I mean, if you go by combine, that's a whole point two seconds faster. Wow, you must have really not learned the playbook or something. How are you that big and that fast? And, and you I like, dude, I, I liked Josh Adams. I maybe th- this is like he's like another Ty Johnson for me, where I'm like, this dude never got a fair shake. I had like, like a fourth I, round grade on him when he came out. I like, thought he was pretty good. good I was surprised that after he had that that stint with the Jets and even with the Eagles, like he was good every time he got the opportunity. You just never, some some running backs, it's weird. They just never get a chance. Um, so I think Josh Adams is a good player, but I don't think I don't think that's a terrible comp. I, I I like Josh Adams and I like Audrey Gestamay. And I, with that, I think it's time to call time on this episode of the Jet Press Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, you know the podcast platforms, you know the YouTube at the Jet Press. That's where you can subscribe and like our streams and check out the whole back catalog and all of our ridiculous takes from last year. They are all there. Justin, sign us off. Got uh, what three or four four weeks until the draft? It is coming up in a month. It is almost here. Uh, we're probably gonna do some kind of special thing for the draft. Obviously we always stream on Wednesdays. So we'll do some kind of like big draft special the, the day before. I believe we did that last year as well, but until then, and until next time, thank you all for joining us on the show today. You can follow Mike on Twitter at by Mike Luciano. Follow me on Twitter at Justin T. Freed. Follow the Jet Press at the Jet Press. Download Jet Press podcast wherever you get your podcast. Check us out on YouTube and TikTok. Subscribe, like, hit that notification bell. You guys know what to do, dude. I'm getting so good at that. I am blazing through that every time now. Yeah, uh, we see- repetition, man. Riding a bike. What it is. We stream live every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you all for listening to Jeff Press Podcast. I've been Justin Freed. That has been Mike Luciano. We'll see you guys next time. See you folks next week.